Herman Bavink in Reform Dogmatics 2, 158 and 159, makes a comment that I find extraordinarily helpful. Um, Bavink says that scripture necessarily speaks of God in anthropomorphic language. Uh, Frame infers from that, that in his um, essence, um, as he stays the same, there is no change in God. As he relates, there is radical constant change. That's how frame takes anthropomorphic language. Scripture necessarily speaks that way. So taking that necessar- that, that language, listen to what Bobbing says. He says, yet, how, here, I'll read the, both sentences. Scripture necessarily speaks of God in anthropomorphic language, yet, however, anthropomorphic its language. It at the same time prohibits us from positing any change in God himself. Just two brief observations. First, um, the referent in view for yet, however, anthropomorphic its, the referent to its is the scripture. So scripture necessarily speaks in anthropomorphic language. Its use of anthropomorphic language at the same time, and here's the verb, prohibits us from positing any change in God himself. There's change around, about, and outside of him. There's change in people's relation to him, but there's no change in God himself. So the, the, the first point is that scripture necessarily speaks this way, but the second point that Bobbing makes is that the same scripture, and this has got to be appreciated, that uses anthropomorphic language That same scripture at the same time prohibits us from positing any change in God himself in his outreach to the creature. Now, the point that I think Bavink is so helpful on here is that he's looking at at that action in time that Frame is looking at, but he says that anthropomorphic language prohibits positing change in God, and Frame says that the anthropomorphic language demands it. And I, and so one way this, and I wanna put this as softly as I know how, but what Frame is doing and what I think some other mutualists have done who are following him is they have actually broken what I would call the reformed prohibition that um, the, uh, I'll call it, James spoke of the sentinel function of simplicity, yes, yes, right? Yes, Remember yes. that? Okay, uh, well, um, Anthropomorphic language shares a similar sentinel function with regard to the divine immutability. It's like a um, anthropomorphic language is like the cherubim guarding Eden. Anthropomorphic language safeguards the actions of God by which he does not change. And I think the text, if you ask uh, Bavink, well, where would you find that in scripture? You join Malachi 3 6, your covenant God doesn't change, with James 1 17. The Father gives good and perfect gifts, and in that giving, odd extra, does not change like shifting shadows. There you've got a biblical summation of this. So, right. so the, the, I, I think Frame inadvertently, he's not doing this intentionally, I think inadvertently he's using anthropomorphic language in precisely a contrary way that Bavink does. And, well, and, we see a similar thing with, with Dr. Van Til, and transition a bit to Dr. Oliphant. Dr. Oliphant wrote the foreword to... Uh, Common Grace in the Gospel, the latest edition of that, in which he he develops uh, what Van Til calls fearless anthropomorphism. But it, in my opinion, in my judgment, Dr. Oliphant is, is positing the opposite of what Van Til is actually saying, because Van Til's point, to my knowledge, is, and there are letters to back this up, uh, that I, I published one recently of his uh, letters that indicate his doctrine of God and concern with, you know, forms of blurring the creator-creature distinction. When Van Til says we must be fearlessly anthropomorphic, what he is not saying is that we can speak uh, with such anthropomorphism that we cannot, that, that we don't need to be afraid of turning God into a creature. That is not what he's saying, because that would not be anthropomorphic language. It would be univocal language in which God is acting as a creature. When Van Til says we must be and can be fearlessly anthropomorphic, what he's getting at is that we can use anthropomorphic language as the scriptures do and not be afraid that what the scriptures are telling us is false. It's true. It is real in the sense that it's genuine and legitimate. God interacts with his people. 
Yet that language is not speaking univocally of God because God does not change. And so when we say God relents and whatnot, we can be fearlessly anthropomorphic to know that it's describing God truly, yet not, uh, but using the categories of creation, specifically the categories of man, forms of man, anthropomorphic, without taking away the legitimacy and the reality of, of this situation. 